Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie late show on the planet at the John Campia Show. Coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, and streaming, and all sorts of good things. And guys, it's a Monday, and uh, this is going to be the only regular uh, John Campia show this week, because as soon as today's show is over, myself and Aaron Cummings, Aaron's on her way over here. She's going to drop off little Joey Bishop for Anne to watch for the week. And then Aaron and I are hopping in the car. We're driving down to Vegas for CinemaCon. CinemaCon. I am so excited about CinemaCon. Uh, you guys know I've been talking about it a lot. Last while. It is my favorite event of the year, even more than Comic-Con. I like CinemaCon even more than Comic-Con, and uh, Aaron and I are going to be driving out for that a little bit later tonight, and I'm very, very excited about that. Now, Aaron was going to be joining me today for the show, uh, but she had a few things come up at her place, so she wasn't able to leave on time to get here, and Rob is out of town. He's in Seattle for the week, so today, guys, is just you and me in an intimate fireplace of movie news love as we cattle up with a bottle of champagne uh, kudos to anybody who knows that reference. I'll keep my eye uh, down in the... Uh, the do you guys know that reference? Champagne? Anyway, we'll cuddle up to the fireplace with a bottle of champagne and just have ourselves a really good time. By the way, our friend Kung Fu Hustle sends... Uh, Kung Fu Hot Dog, I should say, sends in a uh, Super Chat badge in the live chat. Thank you for sending that in, man. And uh, yeah, so listen, we got a lot of things to talk about here today. So let's talk about how today's show is going to go, shall we? We're going to take the first half of the show and talk about some predetermined topics. And then we're going to move into the second half of the show and take your live comments and questions. If you want to send in a live comment or question, simply use the tip link that's down in the description below. Just click on that. Or you can enter it manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be getting your comment or question on the show if it's appropriate for the show. We don't guarantee we'll use them on the show just in case. Uh, but more importantly, you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. And by the way, uh, Bortrek and Cody in the live chat both got it. It was Christopher Walken. Champagne! Christopher Walken on Saturday Night Live. Very well done, guys. Very well done indeed. All right. So... Without any, oh, by the way, I should mention this too. While I'm out in Vegas, I will have some downtime during the days. So on top of the fact that Aaron and I will be doing daily live streams, reporting to you about everything we see at all the things. We've got Sony tonight. We've got MGM and Warner Brothers tomorrow. We've got Neon and Universal on Wednesday. Also, we have a, a screening of Shang-Chi on Wednesday. So we're going to send you a video of uh, Aaron's first reaction to that. Then on Thursday, we got Paramount and Lionsgate. We're going to be doing a lot of live streaming. But... I'm also going to be doing some companion videos while I'm out there. So if you guys still want to send in the live comments and questions, I'll be doing companion videos at least three or four while I'm out there in Vegas because I'm going to have a little bit of downtime. And I hope to see you there, guys. By the way, uh, Mandy's, uh, Mandy's Cabrales, uh, Jake Vidmar, and Jake Garcia all send in Super Chat badges in the live chat. Thank you guys for sending that in. We appreciate that. Okay. With all that down, let's get into an off the top here, shall we? And our off the top today is this. And the reason this isn't off the topic is I forgot the review embargo launches today. Now, you guys know I have been raving about Shang-Chi. I have now seen it twice. Um, I believe it is a top five Marvel movie uh, ever. I believe it is a top five MCU film of all time. It might be a top five comic book movie of all time. Like, it doesn't crack the top three for me. You know, I got Avengers, Dark Knight, Logan. Those, in whatever order you want, those are my three in the top as the best comic book movies of all time. I don't think Shang-Chi cracks that, but it just may crack the top five for me. It just may crack the top five all time for me personally. That's it. I, I can only talk to you about my experience. I don't know what your experience is going to be like. I can just say for me personally. And you guys I've been uh, know I've been raving about it a lot. As of right now, uh, the review embargo has lifted this morning at 9 a.m. So about an hour ago, the review embargo lifted. There are currently 53 reviews have been submitted. And right now, Shang-Chi is holding a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. And that is criminally too low. Criminally too low. 94. Get that junk out of here. It's all subjective. Okay, so 6% of them didn't like it. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. 94 is a perfectly good number. It's going to be interesting to see if that number goes up or down a little bit as more reviews start to pour in. And by the way, Karun Potts sends in a super chat badge in live chat. Thank you for that, man. I appreciate that. So 
And let me talk for a second a little bit here about my general thoughts now, now that the review embargo is lifted, of Shang-Chi. This movie, as you probably heard from some of the reactions that we've had so far, is a beautiful mixture of classic MCU action, some great martial arts action, some beautiful like mythology, like background mythology. It's wonderful fantasy. Robert Meyer Burnett called it one of the best fantasy films of the last 25 years. Um, terrific action, great story, great characters, great dynamics. You know, I knew right away I was going to like it because the beginning of the movie, and I'm not going to give any spoilers away here, but the beginning of the movie um, is absolutely beautiful. Like it's the movie starts off with kind of explaining Tony Leung's character. That's Shang-Chi's father and you know, his origins, having the rings, how he's come down through the centuries, how he's been alive for a thousand years. And then in that first act of the film, we also get this beautiful telling of the story of how Shang-Chi's father met his mother. And it is one of the most beautiful, wonderful, um, gorgeous scenes I've seen in a movie uh, in the last year or two. It, like, just as a scene, when when Shang-Chi's father meets Shang-Chi's mother, it's, I just, Anne was almost crying. Like when Anne was watching that scene, it was time she was almost crying and she was clapping her head. It's just, it's beautiful. I'm not going to say anything about it or how it happens or what goes down, but it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And it really does a good job of setting up where Shang-Chi comes from, because that becomes really important to understanding Shang-Chi as we move forward. I've talked a little bit about the dynamic and we can talk a little bit more about it now. Um, and no, I'm not giving away any spoilers, guys. I'm not giving away any spoilers. I'm telling you, hey, guess what? Shang-Chi has a mother and a father. And at some point, they meet. <gasps> it's not a spoiler. It, it, don't, don't worry about it. That's not a spoiler. I'm not going to tell you what happens or how it goes about or anything like that. But understanding that really paves the way a lot in the later parts of the movie as we understand who Shang-Chi is and what his motivations are and all that kind of stuff. We talked briefly in the reactions about the dynamic between Aquafina and Simu Lu. Simu Lu, of course, being uh, a, a good Canadian kid. Simu Lu, good Canadian kid. Um, and by the way, Simu, if you're in Vegas for this screening of Shang-Chi, sign my wife's damn Simpsons Kim's Convenience shirt. You jerk. Anyway, um, Aquafina is somebody that I never really liked in movies per se. And then I saw her in The Farewell, and I'm like, damn, this girl's actually got real chops. And I loved her in uh, Crazy Rich Asians as well. And her, her and Simu Liu, their chemistry is great. They have a terrific on-screen banter. I just, buy, I just believe that these guys have been friends for a long time. You know, because sometimes you watch these movies and the movies can be great, but you don't really believe that these two people would ever actually be friends in real life. I totally buy into their friendship. I totally buy into this relationship. It's terrific. It, they've got great banter. You can tell they've got a cadence with each other as if they've been friends for 10 years. It's totally wonderful. There are some big surprises in the movie as well, like some really, really big surprises, and I cannot reveal any of them. I will say this. You've heard me say this in the reaction, though. When you go to see Shang-Chi, I believe it's September 3rd, right? Yeah, it's the 3rd that it comes out officially. Or Thursday night, September 2nd. When you guys go to see Shang-Chi, do not leave the theater when the credits start to roll. Okay? Do not leave the theater when the credits start to roll. There are two post credit scenes. One about halfway through the credits and then one at the very, very end. And both are really good, but they both have big significance as to where... I'm not going to say anything more. They just have big significance for where the MCU is going to go after Shang-Chi. That's all I'm going to say. They have significant things in them that are going to hint towards the direction the MCU is heading. And it's it's great. Particularly the first post credit scene. The first post credit scene is... I'll tell you what. The first post credit scene is a top three best post credit scenes out of any MCU movie. It's it's amazing. It's It's great in and of itself. And it has 
Um, and it has uh, a good amount of, uh, of foreshadowing as to where it goes. As to where it goes. And by the way, uh, Caleb Ingram sends in a super chat badge in the live chat, as does Epic Dub Time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. So, yes, it's going. It's it's absolutely great. You get into the middle part. There are some people that think that there are some pacing issues in the in the second act. I disagree, and I think the reason they feel, and I'm only speculating here, but through through reading some people's reactions. It seems like what they're saying is the reason they had some pacing issues with the second act is because the story starts to jump back and forth through time. But I'm telling you, it is that technique in the movie is used so masterfully. I think it just added like, yeah, listen, Shang-Chi is not nonstop action from start to finish. There's a lot of action in it. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of action in Shang-Chi. But it is not nonstop action from start to finish. And in the second act is probably where the least amount of action happens. But so much of the rich storytelling gets told in the second act, as far as I'm concerned. So I personally didn't have, um, I personally didn't have any uh, issues with it. I, I just thought it was really good. Then you move into the third act. And the third act is where one of the big battles happens that they that they show a bunch of in the trailer. You know, in that... Chinese looking village with the giant mythological creatures and stuff like that. It's in the trailer. You've seen bits of it. And that action sequence is nutty. It's a great combination of like the raid kind of realistic kind of martial arts combined with the fantasy kind of martial arts that you would see in something like hero or, uh, or crouching tiger or something. It's a really good mixture, but all the action has narrative purpose. And the second time I saw the movie as the, one of the big final action set pieces is happening. I literally had tears in my eyes. I'm not, I'm not joking. I'm not, this is not hyperbole. I wasn't sitting there sobbing like a baby. Oh my God, this is so wonderful. No, no, but I'm sitting there watching and I'm realizing I've got tears welling in my eyes just because of the power of the action and how it was tied into the narrative and the imagery of it all. And, oh God, I just loved it. Just loved it. And so, yes, I, all I can say is, guys, that uh, I think the 94% it currently has on Rotten Tomatoes is tragically and criminally low. Um, listen, I don't know how much you guys will like it when you see it. I, I don't know because you are different from me. So you may like it more than me. You may not like it as much as me. But I feel very, very confident in saying this. I believe you are going to like it. How much? I don't know. But I feel pretty damn confident in saying I am predicting you will like it. Not everybody will. All film is subjective. But I think most of you guys are really going to like it. I, I really do. And uh, I think you're going to have a good time and, uh, and uh, enjoy it a lot. So, yeah. Anyway, guys. Shang-Chi, it's amazing. It's fantastic. Michelle Yeoh is great. Tony Leung is great. Aquafina is really good in it. Simu Liu is now one of the faces of the MCU. Simu Liu is now one of the faces of the MCU. So, yeah, uh, there's that. By the way, our friend Iconic Reaction sends in a super chat badge in the live champion. In the live, in the live campia. Why did I say that? In the live chat. In the live, that's what we're gonna call the live chat from now on. The live campia. So there's that. Anyway, guys. What do you think about the reviews we see now coming out for Shang-Chi? Jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move into our first main topic here today, shall we? And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by Jonathan Lund, who writes, Hey, John, hope you had a great weekend. I did have a great weekend. Thank you, Jonathan. I absolutely loved Free Guy and was so pleased to see that it was number one at the box office for a second weekend running, bringing in $18.8 million, dropping only 34% from its opening weekend, which is a remarkable hold. This is easily the best second weekend hold out of all of the summer films this year. Why do you think Free Guy had such a great second weekend hold when all of the other films suffered massive drops? Thank you, and keep up the great work. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, Jonathan. And by the way, uh, Devin uh, Pangricker sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Devin. Um, yeah, let's talk about Free Guy for a second, shall we? So you guys know that I have been thrilled that like I saw three movies in a row that I loved. It's been a long time. It's been a long time since I saw three movies in a row that I loved. So that was like... Uh, 
what was it? it was Suicide Squad, Free Guy, and then Shang Chi. Free Guy, of course, is a movie that had like half the budget practically of Suicide Squad. Wasn't isn't one of these movies that looks like it would traditionally do super well at the theaters because it wasn't based on any existing IP. It's not a video game movie. It's not based on any video game, any comic book. It's not a reboot. It's not a sequel. Nothing like that. It's it looks like a movie about a guy who's a character inside of a video game. But it ended up making nearly thirty million dollars in its opening weekend, which by far exceeded their expectations. Now the big question though was going to be what was the second weekend drop going to be like? Because generally speaking, I've told you guys this before, that where you want to see your second weekend drop is between 50 and 60%. If your movie drops 50 to 60% on its second weekend, that's a decent, acceptable, okay range. Like if your movie drops 52%, because we live in a culture that more and more over the last five years, a movie going culture where more and more people go to see a movie when it first comes out, right? More and more. It didn't used to be that way 15 years ago, but more and more and more movies make the bulk of their money right near the beginning of when they get released. So the question, so a 50 to 60% drop is okay. If you drop over 60%, that becomes concerning. Like Suicide Squad drops 70, 71%, something like that, right? Even though the movie was fantastic. Something like Jungle Cruise, The Dwayne The Rock Johnson movie dropped 55%, 56% around there somewhere, right? That's, that's actually, that's decent. That's, that's not bad. That's not bad. Free Guy only dropped 33 and a half percent. Wrap your heads around that. Free Guy only dropped 33 and a half percent. Even in pre-pandemic era, That number is remarkable. That is remarkable. Listen, the good folks over at Deadline say the following. Showing some amazing holding power, Disney slash 20th Century Studios Free Guy eased 34% for a three-day of $18.8 million, putting its 10-day total at $58.8 million domestically. Percent-wise, that is the best second weekend hold for any wide release film this summer. Among those Ryan Reynolds movies that opened north of 20 million in their first weekend, Free Guy clocks as the best second weekend hold of the actor's career. All right, think about that. Of all the Ryan Reynolds films, at least the ones that, you know, had any notoriety and made any money at all, Free not Deadpool, not Deadpool 2, not any of his other films. Free Guy is now the best second weekend percentage-wise of any Ryan Reynolds film. Yeah, I mean, other Ryan Reynolds films have had bigger numbers on second weekend, but not this low percentage of a drop. That is a massive testimony, I think, really to, number one, the quality of the film, but number two, and most importantly, the word of mouth. Because people went and saw Free Guy, and those who did raved about it. They raved about it. People like me, people like a lot of you guys raved about it. And so a lot of people went back. Not only did people go back to watch it for a second viewing, they took new people with them. And some people who didn't go first weekend said, oh, actually, that that free guy movie that only looked okay, a lot of people are saying it's great. Maybe we should give it a shot. And they went out and gave it a shot. And it only takes a 33% drop, 33, 34% drop, which is really remarkable. The question becomes... Why does Free Guy only drop 33% and able to to haul in almost $20 million on its second weekend when another great, widely loved from the people who saw it, you know, big word of mouth movies like A Suicide Squad was only able to manage to to, to pull in a 71% drop from its opening weekend? I think the answer is obvious, guys. Streaming. Suicide Squad was on HBO Max the same time it was in theaters, which absolutely hurt its opening weekend. But most importantly, it killed its second weekend because number one, most people go to see movies they're going to go see in this opening week anyway. But number two is who's going to go see it for a second time in theaters? Most people I know 
who saw and liked Suicide Squad, I think actually everybody I know, I don't know a single person that went back to the theater to see Suicide Squad for a second time because they saw it the first time in Suicide Squad, loved it, got that big screen experience, but for their second and third viewings, they just watched it at home on HBO because it was just there, right? And so Warner Brothers lost a ton of money. They lost a ton of money. And by the way, uh, Kevin Cow sends in a Super Chat badge, as does Zombie TV sends in like a $20 Super Chat badge. Thank you, Zombie TV. Appreciate that, man, very much. Um, as does uh, Jerry Mannion sends in uh, a Super Chat badge as well. Thank you, guys. And uh, Martindale uh, Micklemont sends one in too. Thank you, everybody, for that. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so with Free Guy, though, which Disney stuck to their guns on this film, kept it as a theater only, a theatrical release only movie, and now they're reaping the benefits. Now they're reaping. This thing made almost $20 million in its second weekend. 18 point something million dollars in its second weekend. Only a 33 to 34% drop. That is crazy. I believe the main reason for that, besides the fact that it's a wonderful movie and was well received, it's obvious. One did the streaming route and left a whole ton of money on the table. And one stuck as theatrical only. So people who wanted to see it a second time or bring new friends, they went to go see it on the second weekend and it did really well. So, yeah. I, and I couldn't be happier for them, guys. I really couldn't be happy. This is a joyous, wonderful, delightful, entertaining movie. Top 10 movie of the year by the time the, the, the year ends? Probably not. But it's a just a delightful movie. Wildly entertaining. Do check it out if you get a chance, guys. Uh, and that is just, it's, it's just great. And I'm so happy for its success. Anyway, guys, the question is for you. What do you think? about Free Guy's record-breaking small drop from week one to week two. It's the best for any Ryan Reynolds film. It's the best of the summer so far. Clearly streaming and lack of streaming had something to do with it. How do you guys think about this? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, by the way, Who Dat Comics Movies and uh, Benjamin Nutt and uh, Game Light 7. Benjamin, Game Light. Uh, who dat? Thank you guys. They all send in super chat badges in the live chat. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. Okay. With that down, let's move on to main topic number two, shall we? And it's kind of the polar opposite of, <laughs> of topic number one, but our second main topic today gets sent into us by David Green, who writes, Hey, John and Rob. Unfortunately, Rob's not here today. I saw reminiscence this weekend. And I've personally never been more disappointed in a Hugh Jackman film. But even though I didn't like it, I still expected it to do pretty good at the box office. Nope. It came in ninth place on its opening weekend, making only $2 million. This has to be one of the biggest flops in history, isn't it? Why would this movie perform so badly? All right. Thanks a lot for sending that, that in, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking about, you know, the success, the great success of Free Guy. Now, unfortunately, we had to flip that coin and look at one of the most brutal, brutal cinematic failures, box office wise, uh, we've ever seen. And that is Reminiscence, a movie that cost a relatively cheap $68 million to make yet only managed to pull in, I can't believe we're saying this, $2 million. It only managed to pull in $2 million in its opening weekend. Not in its third weekend, not on its opening night. It only managed to pull in $2 million. A Hugh Jackman film that looks like a Christopher Nolan film and it only managed to bring in $2 million. You're not wrong, dude, when you say this has to maybe be considered one of the biggest cinematic flops in Hollywood history. Not the biggest, not at all, but it's going to be in that conversation. It's, it's going to be considered up there. That being said, we need to look at the reasons why. Why would a Hugh Jackman starring film only open to $2 million? I would suggest there are three reasons why. And we've talked about this a little bit over the lack of buzz the movie got, then it got the poor ratings, the poor critic ratings, and now an absolute bust your face wide open, flopping on your face on the concrete 
absolute total disastrous flop of an opening weekend? I think there are three reasons. Let's get the obvious one out of the way. Number one, again, on HBO. HBO continues to shoot themselves in the foot with this idiotic, moronic, let's put it on HBO Max the same day it's in theaters thing. They continue to lose money as a result of this monumentally stupid decision that they made, and that's obviously one of the contributing factors. Contributing factor number two is, I'm going to say there's four reasons, but contributing factor number two is we spoke about this earlier when we talked about there not being any buzz for the movie. Nobody knew what this movie was about. The trailers were like, oh, look how artsy this movie is, everybody. Ooh. But at the end of the day, nobody could look at the trailers and say, what is this movie about? I get the general background. Okay, it's kind of a post-apocalyptic future. There's an ability to actually search through or relive your memories. But as that's kind of the setting. What is the movie about? And nobody could really give an answer about that. And I think that really ultimately hurt there being any buzz for it and probably hurt a lot of people wanting to go see it. Contributing factor number three as to why I think Reminiscence is like one of the biggest bombs and flops in Hollywood history is it had not good reviews. Now, the last I checked, and you guys can correct me where I'm wrong in the, in the live chat there, but the last time I checked, um, Reminiscence was holding like a 34% critic rating. So that's not going to get anybody excited. So reason number one, obviously, they put it on HBO Max. Reason number two, nobody could tell what the movie was about. Reason number three, it got poor, I'm not going to say the worst, but it got poor uh, critic ratings. So that hurt too. But those are the three reasons I was going to give. Variety also brought up a really good reason. I thought I'd bring it up for you guys to see. Variety came up with another really good reason, which is basically this. A movie like Reminiscence is kind of more targeted at older audiences. And by older, we don't mean 70, 80, and 90, but like beyond the teenage years, right? Not a, a lot of teenagers, obviously some, but not a lot of teenagers are going to be interested in something like, you know, Reminiscence, the way it was marketed. And Variety kind of proposes that this is kind of a um, domino effect of that in the pandemic, which is obviously another big reason, but that's kind of overarching for every single movie that comes out. Given the pandemic, older audiences are the ones that are a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more trepidation about going back out to the movie theaters. A lot of the movie people who are going back to the movie theaters tend to skew a little bit younger. And a lot of the older audiences maybe the wiser and smarter audiences are have a little bit more trepidation about venturing out to the movie theaters. And so when you get a movie like a reminiscence that in its poor marketing, it seemed to be targeted at some older audiences that could be a factor as well. So that's actually not a bad theory that variety came up with as well, but still even understanding all that, it is a shocking understanding that yeah, pandemic for every movie, but the HBO max thing, poor trailers, bad critic reviews, older audiences being more trepidatious about going out. I I still, if you would, I would never, I would have lost a hundred dollar bet. You could have bet me a hundred. Hell, you could have bet me a thousand dollars a week ago and said, John, I'll bet you a thousand dollars. Reminiscence only makes $2 million. I would have laughed in your face and I would have taken that bet in a second. I would have taken that bet in a heartbeat and I would have lost. Because even with all those reasons, that is, to me, guys, that is a stunning number. An absolutely stunning number. Question is for you guys. What do you think about the opening weekend? Let's just call it what it is. I love Hugh Jackman, but let's call it what it is. Historic level failure at the box office of Reminiscence. A $68 million movie making $2 million bucks in its opening weekend. Do you like my reasons for it? Do you think maybe one or two of my reasons are incorrect? Do you have some other reasons that I left off the board? Whatever it is you guys are thinking, jump on down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. Uh, by the way, our good friend Gus's Movie Review sends in like a $20 Super Chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Gus's Movie Review. Appreciate that. Also, Glenmore Legister uh, sends in a Super Chat badge as well uh, in there, as does our friend Connie uh, Sang. And by the way, my wife got together with Connie yesterday. True story. Uh, Anne and uh, Connie got together. Eric the Sailor Man also sends in a Super Chat badge. Thank you, guys. Appreciate all the support, my friends. Okay. With that down, 
Let's now move on to main topic number three. And our third main topic today gets submitted to us by Eric Finden, who writes, It looks like Disney is moving forward with arbitration, which, if I'm correct, basically means that Disney is going to settle with Scarlett Johansson. Am I correct in assuming this? Thanks, and have a great time at CinemaCon. All right, thanks a lot for saying that in, man. And yeah, the gift of the ScarJo Disney lawsuit that just keeps on giving everybody. There is a new development in the Scarlett Johansson Disney lawsuit. Now, just to get you guys quickly caught up, uh, Scarlett Johansson has sued Disney. For those of you who have not heard about this, Scarlett Johansson has sued Disney for the fact that they made Black Widow a day and date release on Disney Plus with the theaters, claiming that since a lot of her salary was tied to how much it would make at the box office, they undermined how much money the movie would make at the box office and thus have ripped her off of millions and millions and millions of dollars. It has gotten very nasty since then, but that's kind of where we are right now. So where are we sitting right now with this lawsuit? Well, here's the newest um, here's the newest twist, okay? Here's the newest twist. So, Disney is now claiming that in their contract, there is a provision where the parties have agreed that if for whatever reason they end up in a lawsuit against each other, either one of them can request an arbitration, an arbitration. And that's, that's pretty standard. No, nothing unusual about that. That is pretty standard. But it raises the question for some people, because I had a bunch of people writing to me this, what ultimately does this mean? And even the question that just got sent in, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding. Disney requesting an arbitrator for their situation here does not necessarily mean they're looking to settle, but it probably does. But it probably does. This comes to us from the folks over at Entertainment Weekly who write the following. Disney has filed a motion to settle a lawsuit brought by Black Widow star Scarlett Johansson behind closed doors. The motion was filed to Los Angeles Superior Court on Friday afternoon by Disney attorney Daniel Petroselli. Uh, in documents obtained by USA Today, Petroselli argued that the contract between Disney and Periwinkle Entertainment Inc. Incorporated, the company representing Scarlett Johansson, included an agreement to settle any disputes through binding arbitration in New York City. So there we go. Binding arbitration in New York City. So what does ultimately this mean? Well, it means this. Disney broke the agreement with Scarlett Johansson and ripped her off. Scarlett Johansson is like, I'm not going to sit there and just take that just because you're Disney. I want my money. And so she's taking them and suing them in court. So Disney is obviously contesting, and we're going to see how this now goes and unfolds. It's going to be very, very interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see how this goes. Uh, by the way, our friends Casey Mack sends in a, a Super Chat badge. Thank you, Casey. As does Max Bolton and Jeffrey Solomon with a big thank you, Super Chat badge. Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate that. So that's where we're kind of at. Now, I've had a couple of people write to me and asking me yesterday, what does ultimately this mean that they're looking for arbitration? And for that, let's take a second and jump into the Campia classroom, sh shall we? What is arbitra what does this mean? Because this is this is going to be important here. Okay. This is important. The first thing we got to understand is that the vast majority of lawsuits, lawfits, lawfits, um, never go to trial. Okay. The vast majority of lawsuits do not go to trial. That's important to understand. Okay. The vet, because listen, trials are expensive. They take up, it costs the government money. It costs taxpayers money because judges are paid and court time is paid and court usage is expensive and all that kind of stuff. Going to court is expensive for the people involved in the lawsuit. It's expensive for the system. It's expensive for the government. It's expensive for taxpayers. It can be long and drawn out. And it's just, that is why the vast majority the vast, not all of them, but the vast, vast, vast majority of lawsuits never actually end up going to trial. They usually end up getting settled, okay? They usually end up getting settled. Now, 
I am giving you just a very brief Coles notes here, okay? It's way more complicated than the way I'm about to lay it out, but I'm just giving you the basic idea, okay? The basic, 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 basic idea. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can do a settlement, okay? Prior thing. One party can offer a settlement that the um, other party can accept or reject, okay? So let's say me and Robert get into a legal dispute. He ate my pizza when I went to, to the bathroom. I came back and he ate my pizza and I'm suing him for $50 million, okay? Damn, that's a pretty good pizza. Damn right. It's got mayo on it. I'm just kidding. Even I don't put mayo up on pizzas, okay? Everybody relax. Everybody just relax, okay? Even I don't put mayo on pizza. But some of you heathens put pineapple on it. Anyway. So, um, so anyway. So me and Rob decide, okay, it's going to be really expensive for us to go to, to trial. So Rob says to me, okay, look. How about I give you $5 million and we just call it a day? Let's say I just give you $5 million and we call it a day. That is a settlement offer. Okay. That's a legal process called a settlement offer. He makes an offer. Now I can accept that offer and then we're done. I accept the offer. He now has to pay me $5 million. The lawsuit is done. Just that simple. And a lot of lawsuits end that way. By the way, just as a side note, um, side note here. This is interesting. Follow me. This is very interesting. If you reject a settlement offer, right? If you reject a settlement offer and it goes to trial and you lose or get less in the trial than the settlement offer would have given you, you may owe extra costs. What I mean by that is this. This is true. Okay. This is actually one of, this is one, of, this is a legal mechanism put in there to encourage people to settle their disputes outside of court. Okay. Let's say, go back to the pizza, the case of the stolen pizza when Rob stole my pizza. Okay. I'm suing Rob for $50 million. Rob sends me a settlement offer that says, hey, how about I just give you $5 million? How would I just give you $5 million? And, and then we call this whole thing off. We save ourselves the legal expenses. We save ourselves all this time and hassle, and we just settle this. I can accept the offer, but if I reject his offer of $5 million, and we end up going to court and I lose, or let's say I even win, but the judge only awards me 4 million out of the 50 million I was su uh, suing for, right? In whichever case, if I go to court with him, I rejected his offer of $5 million. I go to court with him. If I lose or win less than what he was offering, guess what happens? I have to pay Rob's legal expenses. I mean, it, it, I'm oversimplifying. It's different. But if you reject an offer to settle and then it goes to trial and it ends up worse for you than you would have gotten if you just accepted the offer, you will now actually have to pay extra court expenses, your opposition's lawyer fees. You're going to be saddled with another big bill. So that is put into place. So it encourages people to settle outside of court. So you don't unre you don't go, ah, I'll just take my chances to in court to see if I can get more money. Well, then that might end up costing you. And it could cost you a lot. Because if you reject an offer and you don't win more than that in court, you're getting punished with extra fees that you're going to have to pay for the other guy. And that can be very, very expensive. So yeah, they, they are, there is an encouragement to think. But aside from just straight up settlements, okay? There are two other things to keep in mind how these court cases like one between Scarlett Johansson and Disney can be settled. And it's important to understand the difference in this situation and why this arbitration demand from Disney is important. Okay, one thing is mediation. Modiation? Uh, mediation. 
Okay. Mediation. And again, let's talk about me and Robin the stolen pizza. Is Rob and I decide, okay, we'd like to settle this outside of court, but we fundamentally disagree here. So let's go out and get an unbiased third party. So I don't know. Let's say we bring in Aaron. We go get Aaron Cummings. And we say, Aaron, you're going to be our mediator. So Aaron will listen to Rob and I both come up, they explain why he feels he shouldn't give me anything, why I feel he should give me $50 million. Aaron will go and talk to Robert. She'll come and talk to me. And the job of the mediator is to get the two sides to come together to a compromise. Okay. Now, again, I'm way oversimplifying this. I know I am, but just think. So the mediator, uh, their job is to try to get the two parties to come to a compromise of some way, shape, or form, okay? That's what mediation is. And a lot of court cases, a lot of lawsuits are settled in mediation. And by the way, the mediator's final word, the mediator can't give a judgment, the mediator is simply there to try to make a recommendation, try to get the two sides to come to a compromise, and then make a recommendation, right? But the mediator doesn't actually have any real power. Again, I'm oversimplifying it, I know, but that's important to understand. Because that's what moves on to the second thing here, where we're at with Scarlett Johansson and Disney. Arbitration. Arbitration is different from mediation. In the sense that the arbitrator, it isn't there. The arbitrator, like the mediator, is a third party, unbiased uh, person, right? The two sides agree to a third party that comes in will be the arbitrator. The arbitrator's job is not to help you come to a compromise. The arbitrator's job is to be kind of more like a judge. They hear your argument, then they hear your argument, and then they make a decision. And in a lot of cases like this one with Disney, Disney is asking for legally binding uh, decision, which means that whatever the arbitrator says, Scarlett Johansson and Disney have already pre-agreed. Whatever the arbitrator says becomes legally binding and we will agree to whatever it is the arbitrator says. So it bypasses the courts, less expense, less hassle, it gets settled more quickly, all that kind of stuff. Either way, the job of both mediation and of arbitration is to settle out of court. That's all, the goal of all this is to make the parties settle this without it actually getting to court. But here's the key thing about this arbitration. Unlike a court case, which is public record, right? If something goes into a civil court, it's public record. Everything is going to be aired out for the whole public to see. Arbitration, again, I'm oversimplifying it. This isn't always true, but generally speaking, arbitration is done shh, privately. It's done privately. It's not subject to public knowledge. It's all held behind closed doors. Unlike in a public courtroom, this is all done behind closed doors and it's secret. Now, that being the case, Scarlett Johansson's lawyers are not uh, are not like letting this go unanswered for. Scarlett Johansson's lawyers are saying this. After initially responding to this litigation with misogynistic attacks against Scarlett Johansson, Disney is now, predictably, trying to hide its misconduct in a confidential arbitration, uh, Berlinski said in a statement to Variety. Why is Disney so afraid of litigating this case in public? Because it knows that Marvel's promises to give Black Widow a typical theatrical release, like its other films, had everything to do with guaranteeing that Disney would cannibalize box office receipts in order to boost Disney Plus subscriptions. Yet, that is exactly what happened. And we look forward to presenting the overwhelming evidence that proves it. So, here's the thing. Disney knows. Disney knows that in the court of public opinion, Disney's getting slaughtered in this. They just look bad. Disney just looks terrible every step of the way. 
The fact that they pulled this fast one, Scarlett Johansson, in the first place, then that idiotic public response they gave saying, oh, you know, they they publicly revealed her salary and then they you know, did all this kind of stuff, like really scummy moves. And they just realize everybody is against them in this. Almost everybody. So what do they do? And, and they have every right to do this. They have every right to do this. What they did was they have now filed to the court to ask the court to order Scarlett Johansson and them to go to an arbitrator outside of court to shh, keep everything secret. Shh. So what's going to happen here? I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's the same thing that I told you guys was going to happen when this lawsuit first started. It will never go to trial. This will never go to trial. This is going to get settled out of court whether it's by a direct settlement offer. And by the way, even if it goes to an arbitrator, you can still submit a settlement offer. But it's either by a settlement offer, moderator, or or mediator, I should say, or an arbitrator. This is going to get settled out of court. And what's going to happen now is that Disney is going to have to pay Scarlett Johansson. It probably won't be the full 50 million Scarlett Johansson's asking for. But it's going to be kept very quiet. We're never going to know what amount Disney ultimately had to settle for. We're never going to know all the other details, all the confidential stuff that was in the agreement because Disney now wants this held behind closed doors. And it's their right. That is that is a provision in the contract they have. So it is their right to ask for it. But it's not a surprise that they are asking for it because they no longer want this to be out in the public. They know they, they don't have a legal leg to stand on. They know they're getting slaughtered in, in the court of public opinion. They now want this to be secret. They're going to pay off Scarlett Johansson and we're never going to know what the amount is. Which is exactly how I thought this was going to go. It's exactly how I thought this was going to go. So anyway, guys, uh, that's what this whole thing, that is why this thing that Disney is now asking the court for arbitration is significant. Because it means... Maybe good news. We're never going to hear about this again, probably. So we'll see how this goes. Anyway, question is for you guys. What do you think about this whole thing going on now with Disney asking for an arbitrator, with the Scarlett Johansson lawsuit? Every, to, to, honestly, to me, everything is going exactly as how I thought it would go. But question is, what do you guys think? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Uh, and by the way, a whole bunch of guys, a whole bunch of you guys have sent in super chat badges while we were doing that. And it's now off my screen and I can't see them anymore. I'm sorry about that. But thank you to everybody who did. And John Leon just sent in a super chat badge as well. So thank you for that, guys. I appreciate you all very much. All right. With that down, let's move on to our fourth and final main topic today, shall we? And our fourth and final main topic today gets submitted to us by James Argenta who writes a version of the Spider-Man no way home trailer leaked on TikTok on Sunday while Sony and Marvel studios were quick to take it down. Various videos of people watching it from their phones have hit the web. Should Sony release the trailer to show people a better version of the trailer like they did with agent, uh, agent of Ultron. I think you mean age of Ultron or just stick to their current plan. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yep. It all hit the fan yesterday, didn't it? It all hit the fan yesterday. Tom Holland and the Spidey crew had their Spidey senses going off. It's like something's wrong on TikTok. And sure enough, somebody, some idiot, leaked the trailer online for people to see. Now, it is a horrible version of the trailer. I don't know if you guys saw this or not. Uh, Probably many of you guys did. But this was the trailer. It's a video of somebody watching a video on their phone with like horrible audio, horrible visual. It's just terrible. It's just absolutely terrible. Now, it should not be considered that big of a surprise. It shouldn't be considered that big of a surprise because the trailer was going to come out today. Now, look, I I don't know this 100% for fact, but I have been telling you guys for weeks now that we were probably going to get a Spider-Man No Way Home trailer today because tonight is Sony's CinemaCon presentation. It is a three-hour block of time that they have at CinemaCon. Probably about an hour of it's just going to be a lot of introduction stuff, but 
Sony's going to be doing like a two hour present presentation at CinemaCon tonight. And that goes from, I think that's going to be from seven to 9 PM is going to be their presentation. Seven to 9 PM Las Vegas time, which is the same as Los Angeles time. And by the way, uh, Heisenberg sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Heisenberg. I appreciate that. Um, so whatever time zone, whatever time that is for you, wherever you live, that's what time the Sony presentation is at from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And I am fairly convinced that they're going to be showing us uncharted stuff. They're going to show us Morbius stuff. They're going to show us new Venom stuff. But I'm also I've been saying this for weeks that they are definitely going to be uh, showing um, a Spider-Man No Way Home trailer. Absolutely convinced they're going to be showing us a Spider-Man No Way Home trailer. Again, nobody from Sony has confirmed that with me, but it's pretty obvious that that's what they were going to do. And by the way, it seems like that's been confirmed. This comes to us from the folks over at Screen Rant who write the following. The Spider-Man No Way Home trailer reportedly leaked and has been making waves on Twitter and TikTok. Sony has been quick to take all of the videos down. Well, they can't keep up because they're still out there. Uh, but it's terrible, terrible quality and sent out copyright notices. As of right now, it hasn't been confirmed that the trailer was legit. I think it's pretty clear it was legit, but it seems likely since Sony is actively taking down tweets containing the trailer. The trailer was also supposedly watermarked with now this is this is bad, guys. It was watermarked with Wasilla Lumachi's name who was a visual effects artist on Thor Ragnarok. Spider-Man No Way Home's trailer was said to be premiering at the upcoming CinemaCon event in Las Vegas, which is exactly what I've been predicting, which means trailer descriptions are bound to make their way online tomorrow. Well, first of all, let's talk about Wasilla. For those of you who watched that leaked trailer, which, by the way, why would you watch that trailer? I get it out of curiosity. I clicked on it, too, for curiosity's sake. But it's it's garbage. Don't make you if you haven't watched it yet. Don't make your first experience with this trailer this garbage thing that's online. D- don't don't do that. Use wait to watch the full true majesty and beauty of it the way it's meant to be seen. Don't rob yourself of that. I I, I highly encourage you. Don't rob yourself of a really great experience watching the trailer for the first time. Um, but at any rate. When studios send me things to watch in advance, for example, they sent me a digital uh, screener of uh, Jungle Cruise, right? So they send me a digital screener of uh, Jungle Cruise. But when I watch that, there's in faint letters in the background, John Campia is baked right into that copy of Jungle Cruise. So if my copy, if my digital viewing stream copy of Jungle Cruise, if I leak it online or whatever, guess what? Disney is going to know right away who leaked it. They're going to know immediately who leaked it. Who leaked this thing? Oh, it's simple. It says right on the image, John Campia. It says right in there. I'm going to be busted immediately. And maybe I'm not the one who leaked it, but maybe one of my friends, maybe my sister came to visit me and my sister's a big jerk. I won't say which sister I've got two sisters. So that way, you know, they don't want to know which one I'm talking about, but let's say my unnamed sister is a giant jerk. My sisters are not jerks, by the way, but let's say my sister's a big jerk. And my sister goes, Ooh, when John's not looking, I'm going to record his copy of jungle cruise and put it online. Well, at least now Disney knows whose fault it is. Even if I didn't leak it myself, it's my fault. And this leaked version, this leaked version of the trailer had that guy's name baked right into it. So they clearly let him view a copy of the trailer, but they put a watermark on it with his name on it. And so listen, I'm not saying that this guy is the guy who leaked it out. I'm not saying he's the one who leaked it out. But it's his responsibility. He allowed somebody to get their hands on his version of it. And I guarantee you, man, there's some phone calls going on with this dude's lawyer right now. I feel bad for him because obviously he probably didn't send it out by themselves. They clearly probably didn't send it out by themselves or, or themselves. They didn't think, oh, I can get away with this when obviously their name is embedded right in the video. But 
they maybe left their computer open or they left it around where, where maybe they have a kid and their kid's friends took, I don't know, but they're in trouble now. <laughs> they're in trouble. So where does that leave us with this leaked trailer and what's going to happen now? Well, there are two possibilities. Possibility number one is this. It is possible now that Sony, I mean, for all I know, by the with with me actually saying this live right now, Sony could already be in the process of uploading the trailer to online for everybody to see today anyway, right? So that is a possibility. They may think, ah, damn, a, an ugly, crappy copy of it got leaked. Let's just put out the full thing right now. So that could happen. Between now and dinner time, they could put it up a little bit early. But the second option, and this is the one I think they will go with, is they will just stick with releasing it at CinemaCon. They will show it tonight during their presentation. And then as soon as the presentation is over, they will release it online. That has been, now look, they're going to show us a lot of footage of other things too. And they never release that footage online. The studios don't release footage online that they show at CinemaCon. But what they do is release trailers that they've shown at CinemaCon. And usually immediately. So my guess my guess is they are just going to go straight ahead as planned. That they are going to show us the Spider-Man trailer tonight at CinemaCon. I will see it first. And then literally 30 seconds later, like 30 seconds after I see it, it'll be online for the world. So I believe I'll see it tonight. And then the rest of the world is going to see it tonight too. I really, I think you're going to see it tonight. So sometime between, if you live on the East Coast, sometime between 10 p.m. and and midnight, uh, if you're on the West Coast, sometime between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m., but I do believe it's going to go up tonight. At the very worst, at the very, very worst, I think the longest everybody's going to have to wait for a real good copy, like the legit copy, um coming out i think the worst is everybody's gonna have to wait till tomorrow i mean that's that's worst case scenario like i really really think they will release it tonight after the presentation i'll think they'll put it out after the presentation but at worst if it doesn't come out tonight maybe they hold it for one extra day and it comes out tomorrow either way within the next 24 hours i think everybody's going to see the full real trailer for this and again i just encourage you guys as fans all of us as fans, honestly, don't bother watching some crappy piece of garbage version of the trailer. You guys have been waiting for so long. All of us, we've been waiting so long for this trailer, anxiously anticipating this trailer. Why would you fuck yourself in the ear by, by, by then spoiling your first experience with it after spending all this time waiting for it to watch it. Why would you honestly fuck yourself in your own face by just watching some piece of garbage version of it? Hang out for a few more hours, hang out for a few more hours and just wait until the real thing comes out. Make it, make the long wait worth it. Now, obviously most of you, are we're all we're all the same right like obviously most of us are just going to let curiosity get the best of us and we're going to go and check it out i get it i get it but i mean honestly do yourself a favor don't watch that piece of shit version that's out there don't watch it 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 don't ruin your experience believe me you only have a few more hours to wait folks you only have a few more hours to wait now in going to check out to see if it was a legitimate thing that leaked I mean, obviously there's a few things in it. It was hard to tell the audio was garbage. So it was even hard to tell at times what was being said, but I will say this, I will say this. I, I am not afraid to call myself out when a big prediction of mine goes wrong. And I will say this after Spider-Man far from home came out, I made this prediction. It was just a guess, but still, I made this prediction. I made the prediction, some of you guys will remember this, that the thing that happens at the end of Far From Home with J. Jonah basically revealing Peter's secret to the world, right? I guessed, 
and I said this on my show, I guessed that that wouldn't even factor into the next movie. I said it's probably going to be one of those things that gets resolved off camera because Marvel movies do that a lot. They resolve some kind of issues off camera before the next movie starts. They've done that a bunch. They've done that a bunch. So I made the prediction that, you know what? J. Jonah revealing Peter's identity. I bet you that's not even going to really factor into the next movie. It'll be one of those things that they just correct off camera and say, wow, remember when we had to fix that problem with J. Jonah telling people my identity? Phew, glad we fixed that. And that would be it, right? I was 100% wrong about that. (laughs) I was 100% wrong about that. Because... Even in just a few seconds that I've watched of this of this uh, garbage leak trailer, it made it pretty clear that the revelation of uh, of Peter's identity is a big factor of this new movie. Something I didn't think it would be. I didn't think it would be it. You know, I'll remind everybody when I'm right about some stuff. I got to remind you when I'm wrong about something too, because I didn't think it would be a big part of the story, and clearly it is. So that was one kind of thing I picked up on that. But yeah, guys, avoid the garbage version of the trailer. It's going to come out tonight. I'm telling you it's going to come out tonight. At the very, very worst, it'll come out tomorrow morning. But I would bet five bucks. Hell, I would bet $5,000. Theoretically. I would bet five. If somebody came up to me right now, if my buddy came up to me and said, John, I'll bet you $5,000 that trailer won't come out tonight, I would take that bet. It's going to come out tonight. You just got to hang in there for a few more hours. Not even 12 more hours, guys. Not even 12 more hours. Anywhere between like 10 and 12 hours and boom, you're going to have a great, great, great version of this trailer. But I'm excited to tell. But can we talk about this for a second? Guys, it's not just Spider-Man that they're going to show tonight. I am, I'm like, I'm not saying they're going to give us they're definitely going to show us footage of Uncharted, Venom, Morbius. I don't know, but I, I guarantee you at least one of those movies is also going to have a trailer. I would be willing to bet as well that we're going to get our first Uncharted trailer tonight. I think we're going to get our first Uncharted trailer tonight. And then they'll release the Uncharted trailer. And then I believe they're going to show us some Morbius footage, some Venom footage. They won't release that online for the public to see, but they're going to show us that at CinemaCon tonight. I would be willing to bet that we are going to get an Uncharted trailer tonight. And I'm excited about that. I'm almost, I'm not kidding. I am almost as excited about the trailer. Listen, I am not saying I am as excited for Uncharted as I am for Spider-Man No Way Home. But... I am more excited for a trailer of Uncharted than I am for a trailer of Spider-Man No Way Home because I already know what we're getting in Spider-Man No Way Home. I already know I love this Tom Holland as this version of Spider-Man. I already know I love this world that they've created. I know what the DNA and the flavor of this is, so I'm excited for the trailer, but I am more excited for an Uncharted trailer because I don't know anything about what this Uncharted is going to look like feel like, taste like, what's the DNA, what's the temperature of it, what's the mood of it, what's the aesthetic they're going for, what color palette are they using? Like, we know nothing about it. So, yes, I am more excited for Spider-Man than I am for Uncharted, but I'm actually more excited for an Uncharted trailer than I am for a Spider-Man trailer. Because I just think there's more to learn in an Uncharted trailer. But I don't know. Maybe they put a new trailer for Venom, which seems weird because they just put out a, a trailer for Venom Uh, Let There Be Carnage not too long ago. It's been a long time since we had a trailer for Morbius, so maybe they give us a new trailer for Morbius as well. I mean, I don't know, but I know we're going to get a lot of stuff tonight. And, you know, somebody just asked in the live chat, who is it? Michael Gonzalez raises a great point. Raises a great point. Um, Asking, uh, saying, do you think we could get some Craven news? You know what? I wouldn't doubt it at all if we got Craven news tonight. Hell, I wouldn't doubt it if Tom Holland came on stage and then introduced the actor playing Craven and walked Craven out onto the stage. I wouldn't doubt it if that happened tonight at all. A lot of stuff. We're going to get a lot of stuff. And dudes, I'm telling you, CinemaCon is awesome. This is going to happen for all the studios. At the Warner Brothers presentation, at the MGM presentation, at the Paramount presentation. I wouldn't doubt it if Tom Cruise comes and shows up tonight. He's He's gone to CinemaCon before. I wouldn't doubt if Tom Cruise doesn't come out tonight and introduce us to some behind-the-scenes footage of, of uh, either a new Mission Impossible or Top Gun or whatever. Lionsgate is probably going to talk some John Wick 4. 
I wouldn't doubt if Keanu Reeves comes out there on Thursday night. It's going to be great. But that's where we're at right now with the Spider-Man leak. Guys, question is for you. Be honest now. Be honest. Did your curiosity get the best of you? And did you soil it for yourself by watching that garbage version of it first? You wouldn't be alone. I think a lot of people did. Or are you holding strong? Are you holding fast? Waiting for the real, pure, pristine copy of the trailer so your first experience with it can be the right experience with it. How are you guys feeling about it? Jump on down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Uh, by the way, Rachel Knight online uh, sent in a super chat badge. And I think one or two more also got sent in. Sorry, the chat board is going so fast. I'm kind of losing them a little bit. But thank you to everybody who sent those in. I appreciate that. Okay, guys, with all that down and out of the way, Let's now move on and start taking your live comments and questions, shall we? So let's get on into it. And we're going to use the rest of our time just taking your comments and questions here. So we're going to start things off here with Greg, who writes, uh, Now that we're past the miscommunication, I know you think it's a pile of shit, but I'm curious. What are aspects of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that you liked and how would you have improved the show? Well, I'm not going to sit here and do a full review breakdown of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I did that enough when the show was on. Um, other than... Ming-Na Wen and, and uh, Clark Gregg. I thought the characters were terrible. I thought their stories were terrible. I felt no uh, chemistry between them. Again, other than Ming-Na Wen and Clark Gregg, who I both think are great. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the actors in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. are also great actors. It's just that their characters were so terrible. Um, the stories were bad. The characters were bad. The chemistry was bad. Just It was just lacked anything worthwhile to me. Now, I say that recognizing that a lot of people like the show, and that's awesome. I'm jealous. I wish I liked it, but unfortunately, I did not. So, yeah, just nothing clicked other than Clark Gregg and Agent Coulson, Ming-Na Wen. I, I just, the rest of it was just, oh, God, it was just painful to watch most of the time. Like, there were some little stretches and a few episodes here and there that I did really like, but for the most part, for me, it was it was just difficult to watch. And um, by the way, Dragon 10 sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Dragon 10. All right, next up. Uh, Johnny five, six, one, nine writes, holy ball bags, nine perfect strangers on Hulu is amazing. Also, I know you don't like anime, uh, that much, but did you ever watch the Afro Sam uh, Samurai show and movie with Samuel Jackson? We talked about that uh, uh, yeah, a few times in the past. I've been watching you for years. Don't remember if you've talked about it or not. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, and to all, but so yeah, we have talked about that. Um, but nine perfect strangers. It's fascinating to me because Hulu has put out some really good shows and the cast is amazing. The cast for Nine Perfect Strangers is amazing. But the trailer to me looked boring as hell. So I have not checked it out yet, but I am hearing from a lot of people like you, Johnny Five, that it's actually really good. So I think I may have to just start. Maybe I'll watch it when I'm in Vegas. Maybe I'll pop open Hulu when I'm laying in bed at night getting ready to go to sleep. Uh, you know, when I when I tear myself away from the poker tables, uh, maybe I'll uh, jump on there and go check it out for, uh, so thanks for sending that recommendation, man. I appreciate that. All right. Mischievous gremlin writes one of two. Hey, John wanted to ask you two questions. Well, the other question is just to put something on your radar. First, do you still plan to have an open spoiler discussion for free guy, which we, I just put it up yesterday. I just put it up last night. So that's, that's up. That went up la late last night. If not, that's okay. I know you're busy. And also, I wanted to point out that on November 12th, Disney is planning another investor type um, event, calling it Disney Plus Day. So I'm sure we will get some announcements uh, for things to come in 2022. I do think we will have a Hawkeye trailer uh, before that day happens, but I won't be surprised uh, if we get uh, Ms. Marvel release date on that day. What are your thoughts? Well, if it is indeed like November 12th, I think a lot of that stuff is going to be out already, to be honest with you. Now, I got to tell you, that last Disney event that they did, that they streamed, was terrific. That's when they made announcements about Obi-Wan and Ahsoka and Rangers of the New Republic, which is probably going to get canceled, um, and uh, uh, The Acolyte, which is, I'm psychotically excited about The Acolyte, and they made a lot of announcements about the MCU shows, so if they're doing that again, we'll get a lot, but I think like things like Ms. Marvel release dates and trailers, I think a lot of that's going to come out before November 12th, so we'll have a lot of other stuff to look forward to in that event. All right. 
Uh, next up, Preston the Kryptonian writes, Hey, John, haven't written in in a while. Life has been so busy. That's okay. It's just good to have you here, Preston. So I watched the Suicide Squad in theaters and laughed so hard. Little weird, but odds are... I'll, but little weird, but odds are I'll probably watch it again. I noticed Snyder was a producer. Uh, does this mean he still has cut ties with Warner Brothers? Here's the thing. Um, Zack Snyder is listed as a producer on it simply for contractual reasons. Zack Snyder, he'll be the first. Zack Snyder didn't have anything to do with this movie whatsoever. But because of contractual obligations to do with his previous work, he's going to be listed as anything that has to do that's remotely connected to the DCEU part of it. Like not, uh, not Robert Pattinson's Batman, not the Joker. I don't think the Joker, but I could be wrong about that, but you'll see Zack Snyder's name listed as a producer, but he didn't actually have anything to do with it. So yeah, he's currently has no ties with Warner brothers, but Hey, listen, business is business. I wouldn't be surprised if we see him doing other stuff with Warner brothers in the future. Maybe not in the DCEU, but probably other stuff in the future. All right. Uh, let's see next up. Uh, that was Preston. Caleb writes, did you hear the Spawn movie has a new writer? Do you think, do you have any interest in this at all? And do you think it might ever happen? Personally, I just wish uh, Todd McFarlane gave up on directing. No studio will ever give him the $100 million budget he wants. Yeah, I have zero interest in this. Zero. The moment, like what was it, three years ago, that Todd McFarlane says that he, who has no idea how to direct anything, is going to do another Spawn movie and he's going to direct it and they got his script together, but then no financiers would finance it. They just looked at the script and said, this is terrible and nobody would put up the money. And I don't think anybody's going to put up the money as long as he's directing it. So finally, it looks like he decided, okay, we'll go get a new screenwriter. But I, I don't think as long as Todd McFarlane is insisting that he directs it, I don't think anybody's going to finance it. I don't know that for sure. I'm just giving you my guess. Because I know... If they came to me asking me for $60 million to make this movie, which is already risky, I ain't giving it to you if Todd McFarlane's directing it. Dude's never even directed a commercial, as far as I know. Good Canadian kid, but I wouldn't give him the money for it. So I don't think we're going to see this anytime soon. I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. That's just, Again, I'm not saying I have any insider information on that. That's just my guess. All right. Paul Drummer writes, I watched episode two of What If?, Minor spoiler here. I feel like it was too far-fetched that somehow T'Challa can talk Thanos out of snapping away half the universe. I don't hate it, but I think my problem is they're trying to cram too much into half an hour. No, here's the problem, Paul Drummer, is that people are looking at what if the wrong way. What if isn't serious MCU? It's fun little what if stories. So they're supposed to just cram a lot of stuff in there because it's not real MCU. Uh, but John, what are the producers said? It's good. I, I don't care. They're only using semantics because of the way they're saying Loki has sprawled off millions of possible alternative worlds. And it's not really going to impact the MCU at all. I'm telling you. I mean, I can't see the future, but I don't believe it. So stop. I think we got to stop looking at it like that and just look at it for what it's meant to be a fun little story about, hey, what if instead of picking up Peter Quill, the Ravagers accidentally picked up a young T'Challa and he became Star-Lord, right? And by the way, I thought the second episode was better than the first. I wasn't a huge fan of the uh, Captain Carter one, even though I'm a big fan of the Agent Carter character. I wasn't a big fan of that episode, but the second one was better. I, I got a kick out of it. Except that one thing. Just because Thanos is a good guy doesn't mean all of a sudden the Black Order could beat him in a fight. They would never be able to beat him in a fight. Never. Not if all four of them were fighting him at the same time. So that was a little annoying. But other than that, I, I actually thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty good. I did. Uh, let's see where the third one goes. All right. Next up. Thanks for writing that in, Paul Drummer. Uh, Luke S. writes, Hey, John. I know you have mentioned the new Amazon's Lord of the Rings, but are you planning to watch Wheel of Time? I, I'm not going to I'm not excited for it. Anyway. Uh, I haven't seen you cover it or even mention it. Oh, we've, we've talked about it a couple of times. So I'm just curious if you want to watch or not. I have just finished the book series this year. Yeah, look, I think what kind of hurt, um, I think what kind of hurt my desire to see it was um, the Golden Compass stuff uh, that, that they had on, what was it, HBO that had it? What was the one with James McAvoy guys? 
what was the one with James McAvoy that was out? It's not Wheel of Time. Is it Golden Compass? I can't. His Dark Materials. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andre. The His Dark Materials stuff, which I did not think was actually all that good. Now, I get it. This is different. They're two different things. I understand that. But I just don't know if things like Golden Compass, if things like Wheel of Time, I just don't know that these things will work off of a page. I just don't know. I think it works great in a book format. I don't know if it's going to be able to work well as a series or not. So I'll definitely give it a shot when it comes out. I'll definitely give it a shot and we'll see how it goes. But I'd be lying to you if I told you I was excited about it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not excited for it, but that doesn't mean it can't be good. We'll see. All right. Uh, let's see here. Next up. Uh, Mick Lovin writes, Hey, John, I know everybody thought that mutants uh, were going to be created or introduced through the events of WandaVision, which we told everybody they weren't anyway, or Loki. But I believe the event uh, of their creation has already taken place in Endgame. Rocket says when Thanos snapped his fingers, Earth became ground zero for a power surge of ridiculous cosmic proportions, which has never happened in the history of our universe. But. Uh, but before, but in a very short span of time and in a very small space, cosmically speaking, this event, uh, cosmically speaking, this event has taken place three times on earth, exposing the population of earth to this cosmic burst of energy three times over. It would be foolish to assume that there would not be any residual side effects from this massive release of energy affecting the people of earth in some way. I believe mutants were created in the aftermath of the three snaps. Not all the people were affected, but maybe some were, or maybe they just, uh, or maybe they just pass it on to their children. What do you think? All right. So that's been a very popular theory. Uh, that's been a very, very popular theory that the result of the snap or the unsnapping causes mutation. There's a big, there are two big significant problems of that. One, uh, Endgame was written at least conceived of and structure wise long, like before Disney ever bought Fox. So you got to keep that in mind. The second thing though is this. If Kevin Feige decided to make that the event that causes mutation, then you are throwing away all of X-Men's lore. You are throwing away the primary story hook of their lore. An older Eric, an older Charles have been friends for years and years and years and through the ages have developed their thing and blah, blah, blah. And you're throwing all that away and just saying, okay, now mutants are here. The main problem is that with the way that the world of the MCU is right now, mutants wouldn't look any different than other, all these superpower beings. Like the MCU is already so crowded. There are superpowered beings and every 7-Eleven on every corner in every city already. So now the introduction of mutants, it really wouldn't look any different. It would just be, oh, so even more superpowered beings. Okay. Where it's the history of X-Men has to be there to set up the, the the basic crux of what their whole narrative is, right? So it would be a problem. I personally think, if you look at the comics, which the comics are different from the movies, yes, but sometimes they borrow. I think with the Celestials coming into Eternals, look, Eternals, Mutants, and Celestials are all interconnected in the comics, right? The Celestials are... Uh, paramount in the creation of the mutants, at least in the comic books. So if they're going to say anything, it seems like to me that Eternals might introduce the notion that the Celestials seeded certain genetic DNA alterations or mutations ages ago, and they have been there now just waiting to really emerge. I don't know that that's the case. I don't, I don't personally know for sure that that's what they're going to do. There are other problems with that. Um, there are other problems with that, that, that I'm kind of glossing over for sure. But I mean, we'll see, we'll see where they go. Anyway, you're not alone in that theory, McLovin. So that could be what they're doing. I just don't think so. I, I could be wrong though. I could be wrong. Uh, okay. Next up, uh, tribal chief writes, I don't know what Disney will do. But you got to feel bad for everybody involved behind Death on the Nile. Yep. And Next Goal wins. Yep. Now, through no fault of their own, those films may either 
uh, never be released or be dumped on Hulu all because of one man's effed up actions. Smack my head. Yeah, it is. It, it is really unfortunate. It's psychotically unfortunate um, that you have people like you have situations like this where you have one guy in Army Hammer. Right. One guy in Army Hammer who, um, how do I put this? How do we put this, uh, subtly has gotten himself into trouble and has now become a point of real controversy. And because of the actions of that one guy, an entire two entire movies, Taika Waititi's last goal wins or next goal wins, and Death on the Nile. Now the studios just don't know what to do with these movies. The studios just don't know what to do with these movies. And they, they like, they can't just release them, but they can't just sit on them forever. And you're right, Tribal, or, or um, yeah, you're right, Tribal Chief. It is really, really, really unfortunate that all the hard work and all the effort and all the hundreds of millions of dollars and all that kind of stuff is now being jeopardized and endangered because of the actions of one person. It's sad, it's unfortunate, and I really hope they find a way around this. I really do. All right, next up, we got James Argenta who writes, with Riri Williams set to appear in Black Panther 2 now, do you think she will have the Tony Stark AI she has in comics in the movie, or do you think they wait to give it to her until Armor Wars slash her show or have a different AI than the comics. Honestly, James, I think it's completely irrelevant. I, what I don't think we're going to do is have Robert Downey Jr. I mean, you never know. Um, okay. What's that? What I was about to say was, I really doubt they're going to be able to get Robert Downey Jr. to do the voice of the, the suit AI. Like Paul Bettany did for Jarvis, right? I doubt you could get him. But now that I think about it, it is possible. It is possible because, you know, I think Kevin Feige and Robert Downey Jr. have a really, um, a really good relationship. And the reality is all it would take for Robert Downey Jr. is literally to go down to a sound booth and record for half a day, not even a full day. He can go in at lunch and be out of there by four o'clock. And just record all of his lines in one afternoon and then get a nice little paycheck for it. So maybe they could. Yeah, my, my first reaction was to say, nah, they can't get Robert Downey Jr. to do that. But maybe it actually wouldn't. Like, all Robert has to do is say, okay, after lunch, I'll come down and record for a couple hours and I'll go home and you send me a check for $500,000. Maybe they will. I don't know. It's It's... I didn't think so, but maybe it's possible. We'll see, James. All right, next up, Dangerous D writes, Hey, John, I've been watching DC TV shows like Smallville, Arrow, Titans, etc. I see the difference of what DC and Marvel's doing. DC just introduces characters without a great storyline or plot lines. They just put their characters like Deadshot, Gorilla Grodd, uh, Vandal, Vandal Savage, uh, and the fans get excited, then give them crappy storylines and don't forget them. And don't forget them the next season or bring them back just to bring them back for no reason, just to boost ratings. I think DC and CW should take time and shorten their seasons. No, 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 no. Listen, I'm going to say, look, I don't care what any, I don't care what the, it's, that this is the popular thing. You don't have to shorten your seasons, okay? This whole notion that, ah, oh, you know, sh uh, seasons should be shorter. Bullshit. Bullshit. Because for decades and decades and decades, some of the greatest television shows in history were all 20 plus episodes a season. If you can't write a good show, if you can't write a good show over 20 episodes, you can't write a good show if it's six episodes. You either know how to make a good show or you don't. Stretching it out or shortening it up is not going to make a big difference. It's just that there's, if you make crappy show, there's just going to be fewer crappy episodes. So that's not the answer. But you also got to remember that CW is different from DC. CW is its own kind of world, right? With its own kind of flavor. 
Like you can do things on Arrow and Flash and Black Lightning and shows like that that you'd never really try to get away with in a DCEU movie. But they appeal to a CW audience. And that has had some hits and misses, right? The first three seasons of Arrow were fantastic. I, Even though it's had a couple of weak seasons, I think Arrow or um, um, Flash overall has been really, really good. Uh, I loved Black Lightning. Uh, not a fan of Supergirl. That's okay. I haven't been a big fan of Stargirl. Batgirl wasn't really for me. Um, I really was liking Superman and Lois, and then I, I kind of jumped off uh, of that one. But, you know, it's hit and miss. It's hit and miss. But what what I would suggest here, Dangerous D, is don't confuse CW content with the DCEU content because CW is always going to go for its own kind of flavor, appealing to their own kind of audience. And I would just make a differentiation between those things. As far as things like that are off of CW, like Titans, for Doom Patrol is awesome. Doom Patrol is awesome. Love it. Not a big, I don't like Titans. Titans isn't for me, but again, it's just a little bit hit and miss, just a little bit hit and miss, but I do not think the answer at all is in lengthening or shortening the seasons. If you're not making a good show, then you don't know how to make a good show. If your show isn't good at 15 episodes, nothing says it's going to be any better. If it's five episodes, you're either good storyteller or you're not. That's my take on it at any rate. All right. Next up. Uh, let's see. Russell Amador writes, and tips in like $20. Thank you, Russell, for supporting our channel on that level, man. Appreciate that. Um, hey, John, this upcoming week, my wife and I are doing a delayed honeymoon. Nice in Maui. Very cool. Should be epic. Even told me we can watch Candyman out there. Uh, what's a trip without movie outing? I thought I'd miss a full week of shows, but you'll be at CinemaCon, so have fun. Hey, listen, last time I heard Russell, they have internet in Hawaii. I know that's a pretty big secret, but they have internet in Hawaii. But honestly, man, that is awesome that you and your wife are doing a delayed honeymoon and going to Maui is great. So I hope you guys have an awesome, awesome time while you're out there, dude. Have a great time. All right. Next up, Sam Champion writes in, hey, John and crew, I a few days back, um, a few days back, you said you were excited about the new live action My Hero Academia. Yes. Uh, but you gave up on the anime due to Deku's constant crying. Yes. I understand most things are subjective and anime tropes aren't for everyone. However, uh, as a reader of the uh, manga and watcher of the anime, I would highly recommend you give it another go. Nope, not going to happen. I already gave it a full season. If your show is not good enough to get me on board after an entire full season, I don't owe it to you. I'm not going to waste any more time with you. I'm not going to waste any more time. So no, I'm not giving that show another shot. As Deku grows, it's meant to show his growth to take on the mantle of one for all. You will not be disappointed. I already was disappointed. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Yeah, no, I, I shouldn't have to get all, go through multiple seasons just to get to a point where it's finally decent. Uh, no. And lots of movies and shows show a character that has to grow from being smaller to being bigger. You know, meta, uh, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, in, in terms of allegory, not not literally grow from smaller to bigger, but just an allegory, Go, you know, grow. But you don't have to make it so everyone in their lines of dialogue and like this, and oh my God, I'm going to miss this school. And then, then, then. I just couldn't take it. it. It was sickening. I hated it. But the mythology and the storyline behind My Hero Academia is actually really good. It's why I stuck in there for the entire first season before I finally said I can't take this garbage anymore. Uh, because of the crying, right? But, I think the underlying mythology and story is really great. And so even though I don't watch the show, I think a live action movie version of it could be really, really good because it would have all the good stuff and they wouldn't have a live action character. Oh, he's talking like this. It's like, I'm sorry. I'm not five years old. I can't watch this. I can't watch this. And it really sucks because again, I think the characters are great. All might is an amazing character. All Might is an amazing character. And the whole one for all and all for one power sets and all that kind of stuff, there's great mythology there. It's a little bit of, you know, MCU meets Harry Potter. It's it's really a great setup. I just couldn't take the lead character. I couldn't take him. But I think in a live action version of it, I think it could be really good. I think it theoretically could be really good. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. All right. Uh, where are we at? BMC writes. It would be kind of funny if at CinemaCon, Sony brings Tom Holland out for a trailer presentation and it's Uncharted. Listen, don't laugh. 
that both they both could happen tonight. I think both will happen. I think Tom Holland will come out on stage with the president of Sony, and I think they're going to introduce the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer and also introduce an Uncharted trailer. Again, I don't know that. Nobody's telling me that. It's not a fact. I just think that's what's going to happen. So I actually think we're going to get both BMC. We'll find out. All right, next up. Joey writes, Denis Villeneuve was doing an interview with Total Film about Dune, and he said, frankly... To watch Dune on television, the best way I can compare it is to drive a speedboat in your bathtub. Uh, according to IMDb, Dune is two hours and 35 minutes. Yeah, I saw that. Listen, Denis Villeneuve has not taken his foot off the, gra- the gas in blasting Warner Brothers for their decision to make Dune a day and date release on HBO Max and in theaters. He is enraged, the director of the film. One of the best directors in the world right now. He is enraged. And... Instead of promoting it on HBO Max, he's telling people, yeah, trying to watch my movie on a TV screen is like trying to drive a race boat in a bathtub. I I love the comment, to be honest with you. I think that's an awesome comment from Denis Villeneuve. And I love the fact that Denis has not backed off his outrage at Warner Brothers and their idiotic decision to do this and backstab the movie like this. I, I, I applaud him for it personally. All right. Um... Where are we at here? Hold on a second. Why is this stuck? Uh, why is this stuck? Okay, here we go. Next up, we've got, uh, that was Joey. Next up is Jonathan who writes, the aftermath of COVID on theaters in a nutshell, you either die a hero, Arclight, or live long enough to see yourself become the villain, AMC. I'll miss you, Arclight. Uh, you were my number two favorite theater chain behind AMC. Yeah, I really did like them as well. I, I really did like Ar- Arclight very much. When I first moved, when I first moved to um, Los Angeles, the closest movie theater to me was just a 10 minute walk up the street. Cause I lived right on sunset Boulevard in LA and 10 minutes up, 10 minute walk up the street was the arc light Hollywood. One of the big famous and the cinema dome that's attached to it. And it was one of the best movie. That's where like, other than in his own small little indie film things, that's where, like uh, Quentin Tarantino goes to watch his movies. That's where a lot of big Hollywood people go to watch their movies was there. And they had this great rule, three trailers, then the movie starts. That's it. No commercials, no 30 minutes of trailers, three trailers, movie starts. I loved it. It was a comfortable, beautiful screens, beautiful sound. Again, my favorite movie theater chain is AMC, but they were my second favorite to go to. They're my second favorite theater to go to. It was great. It was really, really great. And uh, it is so unfortunate that they became one of the, the casualties of, uh, of the pandemic. And they're gone. Their theaters are getting gobbled up, which is good. So the theaters are still going to be working. But yeah, it it's really is too bad. I'll miss, I'll miss Arclight. I really, really will, Jonathan. All right, next up. Uh, we've got uh, Marie Seifring who writes, Hey, John and crew. Assuming pandemic conditions slowly improve, do you think even in more stable times, box office expectations for blockbusters must be adjusted downward for a long time? Nah, China's being choosy about which films to, sh- to allow streaming, etc. Yeah, but you got to remember, though, um, you got to remember that China is like a lot of people forget China every year is very picky. They only allow China every year only allows certain number of North American movies to play, um, to play in China, right? It's always a finite fixed number. So they, so this isn't a new thing from China. This is pretty constant. They only allow a certain number of films every year. It's not a tiny, tiny number, but it's also not a big number at all. It's only a certain number of films that they allow in there each year. Uh, And by the way, Huey Woodstock sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Huey. Appreciate that, man. Anyway. um, No, I think once once the vac. by the way, vaccinations are going up, which is great to see. Thank you, everybody. Uh, out there, vaccination numbers increase as it continues to increase and rise. That is going to pay off long term. I think we're going to get this thing put behind us uh, fairly quickly. At least I hope so. Fairly quickly. Um, but. And once they do, I think we're going to see box office numbers over the next six to eight months slowly start to get back to pre pandemic 
levels, depending on which movies come out. Now, I don't know that for sure. I don't know that 100%, but I do believe that we're going to get back to relative normal relatively soon. But then again, I'm the same guy who thought when the pandemic was just getting going last January saying, you know what? I bet by August, August of 2020, I bet by August we'll probably be back to normal by then. Yeah, by, by August. That was a year ago. OK, so to take that with uh, with my own grain of salt there. All right. Uh, next, let's move on here. Uh, next up. And we just have time for a couple more here, guys. Then I'm going to have to wrap things up to get ready to leave for Vegas. Uh, Tom Weyenberg writes, I got my tickets for the Venice Film Festival. Very nice, which was a stressful experience. First time going and I'm seeing Lost Daughter Nice, the card counter. That's the one with uh, why am I freezing on the guy from Dune, the guy in Moon Knight, the guy who's in. Why am I freezing on his guys? Who's the guy who's playing Moon Knight? What's, what's the name of the guy? I can't, I can't remember, uh, uh, Oscar Isaac. Thank you. And Anch and Andre and Michael. Yeah. Why did I freeze an Oscar Isaac name? Uh, that's the one with Oscar Isaac. I think that looks really, really interesting. Last night in Soho, the new Edgar Wright film. That looks fantastic as well. Dune, obviously I think is going to be the best movie of the year. That's just a guess. We'll see. Really excited. Yeah. A lot of great things playing in Venice, man. I'm jealous, Tom. I am jealous. I'm glad you're going to be get to go see that. All right. Then we will end things off here with, um, uh, where are we? Hold a second. We are at uh, Viva La Dan. And we'll make this the final one of the day. Uh, Viva La Dan writes in, one of three. It's my 30th birthday tomorrow, Well, on Saturday the 21st. So you obviously wrote this on Friday night. Happy belated birthday to you, my friend. I hope you had a great one. And I just wanted to write in saying thank you for giving me something to look forward to, to watching every day after work. I live in the UK. I've been watching since the WandaVision spoiler show. So it's good to have you here, Viva Ladan. Thanks a lot for joining us. And it's been a pleasure witnessing your enthusiasm and love for the movies. It's infectious. Your opinions and analysis are always well-balanced and fair. Uh, and... Uh, and my pop culture knowledge has increased significantly in the past eight months. Because of you, uh, give my wish wishes to Rob, Kimberly, and Aaron as well. Their energy puts a smile on my face every time. Thanks again, and bring the filthy. P.S. I also put mayo on everything. There's a man with culture and class. Mayo, the jizz of angels, should go on almost everything. Not pizza, not pizza. But mayo should go on every sandwich, on every hamburger, on every hot dog. Hell, you can even dip your fries in mayo. I'm telling you, everybody, become enlightened. Evolve, grow, ascend. Ascend, people, to the next level of consciousness and start eating more mayo. More mayo, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, uh, good to have you around, Viva Ladan, and thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that, and it's good to have you here. Um, listen, why don't we also do Bro Thor here while we've got him here? Uh, Bro Thor writes, Hey, John, so with the new Eternals trailer out and What If series playing, I had two questions. Is Thanos considered a deviant or an Eternal in the movies? Probably neither. I think the M MCU is going to define him as neither. Also, would the Celestials being be considered more powerful than the Watchers or Watcher? I honestly don't know because they haven't really introduced that. Which way? It's one of the big questions is going to be with them bringing the Celestials now in. Of course, the Celestials have we've seen Celestials in the MCU right now, right? We saw the Searcher in. Um, destroying that one planet in Guardians of the Galaxy. We see the floating head of nowhere, which is the severed head of a celestial. Now that we're getting celestials in the MCU, it's going to be interesting to see how the movies treat them. Because remember, the movies are different from the comics. The movies are different from the comics. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see how they do that. And of course, yeah, Sapphire reminds us that, of course, Ego, the living planet, was also a celestial uh, as well. Peter Quill's father who we just saw again at the end of what if, um, so it's, I, I have no idea which way they're going to go, but I am fascinated to find out, dude. I am absolutely fascinated to find out. All right. Uh, from there, we still have more questions to go, guys, from Bojax, Nathan Henry, Underoos, Marie Seifring, and others. 
Do not worry, guys. I'm going to do companion videos while we're in Las Vegas. So you're going to see three or four companion videos go up this week. So if you had sent in a question that didn't get addressed yet, or you want to send in more questions for me to address in a few days, uh, being out in Vegas, go ahead and just use the tip link down in the description of the video, and you'll be doing that, and you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. And all of us involved at the John Campus Show, thank you guys so much for your support. Okay, guys, don't forget, tonight, tonight, Later tonight, after the Sony presentation, Aaron Cummings and I will be live streaming from the suite in Las Vegas to talk about all the things that we see at the Sony event tonight. I am so excited for it. I'm totally stoked. I'm sure we're going to be talking about a Spider-Man No Way Home trailer. I'm sure we're going to be talking about an Uncharted either trailer or footage. Again, Venom, Morbius, lots of stuff tonight. So join me and Aaron later tonight for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there. I cannot wait for it. So that'll do it for me for now, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. We'll talk to you again tonight. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.